Good afternoon. So I'm very pleased to introduce Maurice de Gosson and Charlene also because you are both uh, the co-authors of the presentations, it seems. And uh, Maurice got uh, his doctorate in, uh, at the University of Nice and uh, his habilitation at the University Pierre et Marie Curie, Paris 6. And he's a specialist of uh, symplectic geometry and the uh, and, uh, Wigner functions, Wigner transform. And uh, of course, uh, he got his habilitation under the supervision of Jean Leray. So he's a specialist of uh, all those mathematics around uh, uh, indices and, and so on. So I'm very pleased to again to introduce you. We are, uh, you are going to speak about uh, Gaussian states, symplectic geometry, and the Wigner, certainly Wigner functions, those wonderful objects of quantum physics. So please. Thank you, Professor Gazzo, for your kind presentation. And I would like to thank the organizers, Professor Barbaresco and uh, Professor Nielsen, for a kind invitation to this magnificent place and I'm going just to talk in front of Richelieu so it's a great honor. Yes, okay, so I'm going to talk about a very basic but very important topic, uh, that of Gaussian, uh, Gaussian quantum states and more generally about quantum states here and their relationship with symplectic geometry and other things. Oh, actually, even if this topic is very simple, there are still problems at the cutting edge of uh, current research. I'll mention them a little bit then. So let's see if this works. No. Ah, yes. Okay. Okay, so following Wikipedia, what do you say is a mathematical entity that provides a probability distribution for the outcomes of possible measurements of a state. So, of course, I'm trying to, I would try to give a more precise working definition of that to see a little bit the consequences. Uh, there are, of course, many uh, philosophical and ontological problems involved. I will not address them, if only by lack of knowledge. And as uh, Richard Feynman repeatedly put it, philosophy of science is about as useful for scientists as ornithology for birds. Of course, that's a very a jokeful statement and a little bit unfair for those working in philosophy of science. I myself do it as a hobby. The problem is that if you take two philosophers of science, they will always have diverging ideas. And I mean, it's really a field where nobody has right. And, but that's the charm of it also. Huh? Disputes about, is the wave function on the or epistemic, well, ask two different philosophers, they will give you different answers. Good. So, uh, no, yes, okay. So what is a quantum state? Well, first, a pure state is a non-zero element, a state vector of some complex, of some complex Hilbert space H. I would take in this talk always L to Rn, that is the square uh, integrable functions on Rn as Hilbert space. This allows you, us to consider infinite, infinite dimensional states and so on. A mixed state is actually a statistical classical mixture of pure states. Uh, it's a statistical melange consisting of pairs, psi j, alpha j, of weighted pure states, uh, the weights being functions uh, or numbers alpha j larger than zero and who sum up to one, that is, they form probabilities here. One usually assumes that the Psi J are normalized to one, that's just a technical assumption here. For all practical purposes, for instance, the definition of the mean and of the covariances, one usually assumes that the Psi J, in addition, satisfy some sufficient uh, decay conditions at infinity, so you get convergent integrals. So the most extreme best choice is to choose a Gaussian or more generally a states or states belonging to uh, a Schwartz space. The in-between choice, which is perhaps the most uh, useful practically, is to use what one calls uh, Feichtinger modulation space. 
I will have a little bit more to say about that in a moment. These Feistinger spaces are functional spaces which are between, something between, they are Banner spaces, between L2RN and SRN. Yes, okay, closer to the microphone. Okay, thank you. Okay, the density operator. So the, the notion of density operator, the notion of density operator is due originally to John von Neumann and many other people. So a density operator associates to a mixed state, an operator, rho hat, which is the sum of uh, the alpha j, pi, psi j, the pi psi j being the orthogonal projections on the rays uh, passing through psi j. Uh, on the right side, you have the physicist's bra cat notation, which is very convenient sometimes. It has a disadvantage of sometimes also obscuring the mathematical meaning, and well, that's a matter of taste, of course, here. So uh, the operator rho hat, you can verify it easily, is a positive semi-definite uh, oper trace class operator with trace equal to one. The trace here plays the role a little bit of uh, the sum of probabilities. One should, however, be fair, careful with that. Uh, being a trace class operator, the density operator is compact, and this has very nice consequences. Why it's compact, you can see it by saying, for instance, that it's the product of two Hilbert-Schmidt operators. Hilbert-Schmidt operators being almost trivially compact. Well, oops. <laughs> you get a compact operator as well here. So, uh, yes, okay, but since it's a compact operator, you can apply the spectral theorem for compact operators, and you can find an orthonormal family of vectors here, psi j or phi j here, and a sequence of positive numbers summing up to one, so that rho hat can be expressed as the weighted sum of these projections, but taking this time the orthonormal operators phi j. So this show, shows that once that a density operator can be represented as several different mixtures. Oh, that's better now. If I could see time was over here. Thank you. Here. So uh, the, the, the fact that the density operator can be represented by different sums was already observed by Schrödinger in 19. 25, and you have actually a deep theorem which is very useful and which was proved by Jaynes in 1957, I think, here. Uh, Jaynes actually proved that in the case of finite sum, but it's not too difficult to generalize it to, case, to the case of infinite series. Uh, for that, I hope you know. Okay, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, hope, I hope this will surface here. So Jaynes' theorem is interesting. It just says that if you take an arbitrary mixed state, uh, psi j, lambda j, and an orthonormal basis, phi j uh, or phi k of L2 Rn, you can express the vectors psi j in terms of the phi k and the operator defined by a hat phi j equal to the sum with respect to k of square roots of lambda j one half, a j k phi k is a Hilbert Schmidt operator and the density operator is then given by the product a hat, a hat, uh, star. And uh, so this gives a nice description here and it allows you also to relate to mixed states here through uh, the part ii of this theorem here. Well, it's not so well known because in the physical literature we often find the claim that yes, okay, to two different statistical melange can give rise to the same uh, density operators. And then you have a trivial example, for instance, a Bell state or something really, really simple. So this result is much deeper and allows you to work really in the general case. So James did that in 57, but there were precursors also, Schrodinger, but Schrodinger's proof from 1925, I think, was, of course, not very rigorous by today's standards. Good. So, what's now the Wigner distribution of a density operator? Well, we take a density operator, rho hat sum of the lambda j by j, and to this we associate the function rho, rho without a hat, defined by formula 1 here. 
where W psi j is the, the ordinary Wigner transform of psi j, which is defined in the line there under here. So the notion of Wigner transform has a long story going back to a paper of 1932, I think, of Eugene Wigner. Here, and Eugene Wigner introduced that W psi j is a substitute for a probability distribution in quantum mechanics. The problem is that W psi or W psi j cannot be interpreted in general as an ordinary probability distribution because it usually takes negative values. I mean, it actually always takes negative values except if psi j... <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, more, more. <laughs> except, except if psi is a Gaussian function. We'll come back to that in a moment here. And the series one is convergent in L2 Rn and its integral over R2n, that is over phase space, is equal to one. Provided that rho belongs to a Shubin class, I'm going to explain what this is, with m sufficiently small. You see, our French physicists have a tendency always to say, yeah, okay, we take a lump, something like that here. Well, it should represent the quasi-distribution. Hence, its integral is equal to one, but it's false in general. It's a false in general. They are, uh, counterexamples. So what is a Shubin class? Shubin class is a class of functions defined on phase space. Uh, the definition which I've written there is that of the space gamma m delta r to n, where m is an arbitrary real number and delta is between 0 and 1. So it's a vector space of all functions a infinitely differentiable such that for every alpha in n to n there exists c alpha positive such that you have the estimates too there. Uh, <laughs> these estimates are very symmetric and nicer than the usual uh, definitions of symbol class, of, of classes of symbols as the Hermander case and all that because they are symmetric in z. z here is xp uh, the phase space variable here. Uh, for instance, any polynomial AZ of degree M belongs to uh, the class gamma M1 uh, and, uh, and so on. So it's easy to produce examples of such symbols here. Uh, the theorem is that the Wigner distribution rho here satisfies two, that is the Schubin condition, if and or, no, not if and only if, if the psi j belong to a Feistinger modulation sp space M1s for some s larger or equal to zero. So what's the notion of Feistinger space? Uh, let's take s equal to zero, for instance, same case. Then psi belongs to M10 if and only if psi is in L2 and W psi is integrable. So you might immediately object, but that's not a good definition because it cannot be a vector space because the Wigner transform is not linear. Yes, but still, it is a vector space. And you can prove that by providing a, an equivalent definition to the Weithegger step A in terms of what is called the cross Wigner distribution. Well, that's a, a whole theory, but nicely enough, it's true that this Weithegger space is really a vector space. In addition, it's a uh, an algebra for ordinary product and for convolution. And uh, if you take s equal to zero, you obtain the so-called fighting algebra, which plays a central role in Gabor analysis and um, other related topics in harmonic analysis here. So uh, the proof of this condition is uh, simple. It was published a few weeks ago just for the sake of completeness in archive. It's, it's just four pages, and, but still. Okay, so in the general case, again, the formula, uh, uh, the formula about the integral, that, uh, the almost last line, is not true in general because of convergence problems. Okay, so now the Weyl symbol of a density operator. It can be introduced quite uh, naturally here. The Wigner distribution of rho hat, that is the function rho, is 2 pi h bar up to the n times the Weyl symbol of rho hat. That's the formula 3, you have that. 
Equivalently, rho hat is an operator with distribution kernel given by formula 4 here. Uh, we see the presence there in the middle, in the integral of one half of x plus y. So this is very, very, does very much indicate the presence of what is called wild quantization here. Okay, wild quantization is not the only possible quantization. You can also write the operator rho hat as a born Jordan operator associated with a symbol and so on and so on. I'm going to use in this talk mainly wild quantization because of its simplicity and because it has a very nice property which is called symplectic covariance also. Uh, it seems that uh, vial quantization is anyway the most used quantization procedure by physicists. Uh, that's a matter of taste, you know, vial quantization was introduced I think in 1925, eh? yes, uh, just a couple of years after the quantization introduced by Bohr and Jordan which is, in a sense, a more physical. And, uh, well, I have studied the topic rather much, and it, I mean, it's a matter of taste which one you choose. Still, there are indications that born Jordan quantization, born Jordan ordinary ordering is more natural, but this is almost philosophy. No, not quite, not quite, anyway. <laughs> Good. So the proof is elementary, and Physicists would write that as formula 5 by using bra cat notation again. They can express rho, uh, that is the Wigner distribution, as an integral involving uh, rho hat here. Yeah. Fine. Okay, statistical interpretation, I think everybody knows that. Since you can treat rho as a quasi-probability distribution, it will give you Nice uh, formulas. The formula six there, it says that, yes, okay, well, I can take it as a postulate actually, that the average value of an observable A hat, by observable I mean here a bounded operator on L2RN, it's a very restrictive uh, condition, of course, because in, then the, the multiplication by x would not be unobservable. That's another question. We're not address it here. But an observable a hat has an average value a hat given by the trace of rho hat times a hat. Uh, the trace of rho hat a hat exists because rho hat is a trace class operator. Uh, trace class forms an ideal a two-sided ideal in the bounded operators. So A hat rho hat or rho hat A hat just forms again a trace class operator so you can take the trace. Now this formula is often written by physicists as the integral there involving rho z A z where A z or A is the wild symbol of the observable A hat. Uh, you must be more than careful with such formulas. In general they are false. Mathematically, they do not make sense unless you put very stringent conditions, again, on rho Schubin classes and so on, so you have a sufficiently fast decay at infinity here. Uh, it's like also uh, trace formulas involving the integral along the diagonal of the kernel. They are also false in general. There's a nice little book by Barry Simon about trace ideas and all that, where he gives counterexamples. Well, on the positive side, Barry Simon says that the probability that such a formula is false is zero, because it's very difficult to construct counterexamples, but nah, that's another thing. So again, careful when you use integrals of the type there, uh, of the type 7. I don't see this is 7, but it's, uh, yeah. Good. So now the statistical covariance matrix. Good, so under certain conditions of rapid decay of rho z, you can define the statistical covariance sigma by the integral you see there. You see you have a, a vector z there minus something times its transpose. So it forms a matrix, a 2n, 2n matrix here, symmetric matrix. If you integrate that with respect to rho z, then you get a matrix, which is called the statistical covariance matrix. But, of course, this integral does not make sense in general, as I just told. So you must, or no, 
it's sufficient to assume that rho belongs to some uh, Schubing class with m smaller than minus 2n minus 2 to ensure convergence here. Or equivalently, if rho is a convex sum of Wigner transforms with the psi j belonging to a Feithinger space with some s larger or equal to 2. These are sufficient conditions, not necessary, of course. So once you've done that here, there's a fundamental property of uh, if you have a quasi distribution or a statistical distribution rho, you can always define the covariance matrix provided that you have some conversion conditions. But in the quantum case, this matrix must satisfy the condition 8 that I had written there. That is, sigma plus i h bar over 2 j must be positive semi definite. That is, all its eigenvalues must be larger or equal to zero. This is a very strong condition. It means that if it's not satisfied, your state cannot be a quantum state here. Uh, J here is the standard symplectic matrix. I will say more about that in a moment. But the condition implies, among other things, that sigma is positive, definite, hence invertible. Okay, it was first proved by Narkovich and also by Narkovich and O'Connell uh, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, the proof is based on the Kassler Lupias Miracle Sol study of C star algebras here. It's rather technical and uh, it uses a quantum version of Bochner's theorem on the Fourier transform of, posi of positive measures. Let me just give you a flavor of that here. Yeah. So, what's the quantum Bochner theorem? It says that if you take a uh, an integrable function a in L1 and you assume that a hat, the operator with the vial symbol a, is a trade class, then this operator is positive semi definite if and only if the symplectic Fourier transform of a defined by 9 here is of h bar positive type. That is, if condition 10 below is satisfied. So, the condition is on a matrix of arbitrary order big N. Its elements are an exponential involving the symplectic transform, uh, the symplectic uh, uh, form sigma, and the symplectic Fourier transforms of A hat here. Yeah. Uh, observe that you have an uncountable number of conditions here, which makes the practical use of this condition extremely difficult. Also observe that if you take h bar equal to zero, you recover the usual Bochner theorem, well, which is a well-known result from measure theory. So <clears throat> the original proof of uh, Kassler, uh, Lupias, and, and Miracle Sol is very complicated. Well, for someone who is not familiar, familiar with uh, C star algebras. Uh, I have given together with my colleagues Cordero and Nicola an alternative proof using the properties of Heisenberg operators here. And we have actually <coughs> given a relatively short proof of thereof and I've used the, the theory of Gabor frames then to generalize this a little bit or to, to make it look a little bit nicer by producing uh, countable set of conditions, which is already an improvement, which makes things a little bit more tractable. But so you see the, the, the condition here, uh, sigma plus i h bar over 2 j, uh, positive or equal to zero, is really a delicate uh, condition. The, the, the proof of it is not obvious. Yeah. Ah, related to vial operators, we have the symplectic covariance property. Well, I pass rather quickly here. Uh, for the symplectic geometry here needed, it's rather elementary for those who, is, who are interested in uh, many developments and a full study of symplectic geometry. Uh, the, the book by uh, Professor Marl and Lieberman is still a universal, almost universal source. And uh, yeah. But, but, okay, the symplectic group is generated by J, the standard symplectic matrix, and the matrices V minus P, ML. Okay, these are standard generators. To that, we associate the metaplectic group. 
You see, SPN, the symplectic group, is a connected Lie group, okay? And it's contract contractible, actually, to the unitary group. So the unitary group can be identified with a maximal compact subgroup of SPN. It follows that SPN has the MEM, the MEM, <laughs> sorry for this, has the MEM uh, Poincaré group as UN, that is Z plus here, the integers here. So SPN has infinitely many covering groups, SPQN, and one of them, SP2N, the double cover can be represented by a unitary group of operators acting on L2RN, the metaplectic group, and the latter is generated by the elements given by A1, A2, A3. Uh, J hat is essentially the Fourier transform. Uh, v hat minus P is what is called in, in harmonic analysis or signal theory chirps here. And M hat LM are unitary rescalings here. Uh, the M appearing formula A3 is a baby mass of index, in fact. It indicates which choice of argument of determinant of L you take here. And the property of file calculus, which is called symplectic covariance, is given by the formula that in the theorem, if you have a quantization, or a pseudo differential calculus here, then if you replace the symbol A by A composed with S minus 1, where S is symplectic, then it's the same thing as conjugating the operator with symbol A with S hat, which is one of the two metaplectic operators covering S. This is very well known. Uh, what is a little bit less well known is that the other way around, if you have a quantization satisfying that, then it must be the wide, wide calculus. That's why physicists like using uh, wild calculus because it's very symmetric. It has SPN as a group of symmetries and it's nice, of course. Then whether it's really the best choice, again, that's another matter. Yeah, good. So Gaussian states, which are included in the title of this talk here. A Gaussian state is just a state which has as a quasi-distribution the Gaussian 11 here. Ah, uh, okay, I'm assuming that it's centered at zero, but this is just a very slight restriction. You can, by replacing z by z minus uh, average value of z, have an arbitrary Gaussian distribution here. And the theorem is that rho is the Wigner distribution of a density operator, rho hat, if and only if the quantum condition sigma plus i h bar over 2j positive is satisfied. So we're back to the Casa lupias Bergson theorem and the quantum Bochner theorem and all that here. Uh, mm. I have a few references again, Narkovich, then E. Cordero, myself, and Nicolas, published in Advances in Theoretical and Mathematical Physics, and then um, in a book which is very recent also here. Oh, Observe that the purity of a Gaussian state, yeah, the purity of a quantum state is the trace of the operator squared. I think that everybody knows that definition more or less. It's easy to calculate that, and you find that the trace of the purity of a Gaussian state is then h over 2n, determinant of sigma minus 1 half. You can, by the way, verify that if the quantum condition is not satisfied, you will get a trace of row squares which is larger than one, which is stupid. Of course, this is impossible here. Good, so pure Gaussian states, a few words about that. So when the trace of row squared is equal to one, you get, you can prove that rho z is, corresponds to the Wigner transform of psi phi x y of x, equal to, and there you have the formula, it looks quite complicated, but you can see that it's just a Gaussian on Rn, which has uh, uh, in the exponent big X plus Iy, where X is positive, definite, and symmetric, and Y is just symmetric. If you take the Wigner transform of that, you get a simple formula, 
1 over pi h bar n, and then the exponential of minus 1 over h bar g z z, where g is a, symmetry, a symplectic matrix. g is h bar over 2 times sigma minus 1, the covariance matrix inverted, and given by the expression 12 there. And it's easy to see by factorization or by, by just applying applying the necessary sufficient conditions for a matrix to be symplectic, that G is symplectic here. And this is very, very interesting. Uh, this formula was proven the first time, I think, by Janssen, uh, working signal theory in the, in the early 70s, I think, here. Yeah. Uh, of course, if you take big X equal to the identity and Y equal to the uh, to zero, then you get the classical coherent state here. And the interesting things, well, I denote the standard coherent state here by phi index zero, is that every Gaussian psi phi xy can be obtained by, from phi zero by applying an adequate metaplectic operator. In other words, uh, the orbits of the metaplectic group yeah. on, the, on the variety of Gaussian states all cover this variety. Uh, the, the metaplectic group acts transitively on the set of all Gaussian states here. <sighs> well, this is, in, princ in principle, well known, but physicists often formulate it a little bit differently. Good here. Okay, so let's come back to the quantum condition, sigma plus i h bar over 2j positive here. You have multiple but very interesting meanings here. So I write the covariance matrix in block form here. Sigma xx, sigma xp, sigma px, which is the transform, uh, the transpose, sorry, of sigma xp here. And the, the elements of these matrices are the variances of the covariances familiar from, a, from elementary statistics. So the first theorem is that if the quantum condition is satisfied, then we have the Robertson-Schrödinger inequality, which is the strong form of the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics. So sigma plus i h bar over 2j positive implies the uncertainty principle here. The proof is not very difficult. It's linear algebra. You use the principal minors of the matrix and you make some calculations and this pops out. It's very easy to see if you take n equal to 1, because then it's equivalent to saying that the determinant of sigma plus i h bar over 2j is positive, and you get it immediately. However, however, it's a stronger condition than the uncertainty principle. In other words, the, the uncertainty principle is not enough to guarantee that you have a quantum state, you can put it that way. Here's a very simple counterexample, take n equal to 2 and define sigma as I did there. You see that the robertson schrodinger inequalities are satisfied, trivially, but, 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 sigma is not positive and sigma plus i h bar over 2j is indefinite because its determinant is smaller than zero. So the Uncertainty principle is not enough to guarantee quantumness. Fine. Another meaning of the quantum condition. Well, this slide here is technical. It uses what is called the Williamson, Williamson diagonalization, or symplectic diagonalization of a positive definite matrix. Well, it says that if you have a sigma positive definite matrix, then you can diagonalize it using a symplectic matrix. That is, sigma is equal to ST, DS, where D has a very special form. It's a diagonal matrix with lambda and lambda in the diagonal, and the elements of lambda are the so-called symplectic eigenvalues of sigma. What are the symplectic eigenvalues of sigma? They are just the, defined by considering the product J sigma, uh, its eigenvalues are the same as those of sigma one half j sigma one half, of course. Yeah, but <laughs> sigma one half j sigma one half is an anti-symmetric matrix. So its eigenvalues are of the type plus or minus i lambda, where lambda 
or lambda j is positive. These positive lambda j's are just called the symplectic eigenvalues of sigma. The set is what is called the symplectic spectrum of sigma here. This is a very useful result, which is used all the time by people working in quantum optics or in, the, or in quantum information theory here. And so the thing is that the condition sigma plus i h bar over 2j positive is equivalent to condition 30. You prove that using rather elementary uh, rather elementary uh, linear algebra again. So the smallest, hence all, of the symplectic eigenvalues are minorated by one half of h bar. And this has the following consequence. If I consider the covariance ellipsoid omega, which is defined by one half of sigma one minus one z times z smaller than one, it's called in classical statistics also the covariance ellipsoid. If I replace sigma minus one by sigma, you get the information ellipsoid. It's called, uh, well, and I denote by B2n square of h bar, the ball with radius uh, square root of h bar. Then the inequality lambda mean larger or equal to one half of h bar implies the theorem you have below. This seems a little bit mysterious, perhaps. It says that the condition sigma plus i h bar over 2j is equivalent to the existence of a symplectic matrix or symplectic automorphism such that s times the ball is included in omega. That is, the quantum condition is satisfied if and only if you can squeeze uh, the ball with radius, radius square root of h bar inside omega using a linear symplectic transformation here. Actually, and we'll see that in the next slide, you can do it with arbitrary symplectomorphisms also here. That is, put differently, the symplectic capacity of omega is at least pi h bar, where the symplectic capacity is defined there in the line there, where simp n is the group of all symplectomorphisms of R to n. Uh, well, there are references. Oh, I made that a few years ago already, a long time ago. So what's this symplectic capacity? It, it's a very, very nice uh, notion, which is made possible by Gromov's symplectic non-squeezing theorem, which is a very uh, famous theorem from symplectic topology, <laughs> proved in 1985 by Gromov. It actually really rejuvenated the field of symplectic topology because it led to many results and it allowed the, def the definition of the notion of symplectic capacity. Well, I'm not going to discuss too much about that here because uh, I do not have time, but it's really worth, uh, worth uh, using that. The only problem is that the calculations of the symplectic capacity is difficult. For instance, one does still not know what is the symplectic capacity of a cube in arbitrary position. Mm. But, uh, so, but theoretically, it's a very interesting concept which can be used, as I did here, to reformulate the uncertainty principle in a very concise form. Uh, yeah, well, okay. Okay. A last thing here, which I, I proved uh, last year, actually, and seems to me to be very interesting. Uh, the notion of polar duality. I assume that most of you are familiar with that. Suppose that h bar is equal to 1. Then the polar dual of x, which is a symmetric convex body, is then x h bar, the set of all p's, such that px is smaller or equal to 1. Here I put h bar no difference, of course, you just have a rescaling here. So you prove here that if the covariance ellipsoid omega satisfies the quantization condition sigma plus i h bar over 2j positive, then the orthogonal projections big X and big P of this ellipsoid on the configuration space and on the momentum space are such that x h bar is included in P. So this is an important result because 
because you can uh, uh, actually then restate a little bit loosely, okay, but uh, the, the uncertainty principle by saying that a quantum system localized in the position representation in a set X cannot be localized in the momentum representation in a set smaller than its H bar polar dual AXH. So this actually I suggested in the paper mentioned there, Foundation Physics uh, 51, I suggested uh, many consequences of that. And one strange thing and interesting thing is that it relates the uncertainty principle to the Mahler conjecture about the Mahler volume of, uh, uh, of, a, of a convex body. This is strange and perhaps it could give a clue to a proof of the Mahler conjecture. I don't know. I haven't <laughs> went that far yet here. Oh, how, Chairman, how much time do I have? Oh, so which chair? Okay, then very quickly, entanglement. There you have a few citations about entanglement here. Okay, the one I like the most, the, the most is that of Asher Perez. A trick that... Three minutes. Three minutes. Ah, okay. Thank you, thank you. A tr entanglement is a trick quantum magicians use to produce phenomena that cannot be imitated by classical magicians. Mm, C'est un peu vrai. Okay, okay, so definition of separability versus entanglement. Well, I assume that everybody working in quantum mechanics is familiar with that. The density, the state is uh, separable if you can write rho hat, the density operator, as in 15 here. If it's not separable, it's called entangled here. Okay, so you have one known uh, necessary criterion for separability, which is called the PPT criterion. That's the positive partial transpose here, which says, which says what the formula 16 says. That is, if you transpose one of the states here, you still obtain a density operator here. It's very e Well, physicists prove that using complicated arguments. If you know the theory of the Wigner transform, it's very easy. You just... You just uh, uh, note that the, the transpose of a vial operator is obtained by replacing its symbol AXP by AX minus P. Good. And the PPT condition is also sufficient if NA times NB is smaller or equal to 6 here. Now we have a very interesting condition here, the Werner Wolf Serafini condition here. The theorem you have there, you can read it here. It's a condition on the covariance matrices. Uh, it's necessary for arbitrary quantum states. It's sufficient and necessary for Gaussian states here. It's, this inequality 17 means that, okay, if you can split and transform the covariance matrix in such ways that you obtain two other matrices, Smaller dimensions, sigma a and sigma p, such you have the inequality 70, then you're sure that your Gaussian state is separable. Yeah. Good. And then our uh, disentanglement of Gaussian states in a recent note or compte rendu here in the paper letter in mathematical physics, I proved a result saying that a Gaussian density operator can be separated always by. A symplectic rotation. What is a symplectic rotation? It's a symplectic transform which is at the same time orthogonal here. And uh, that is, there exists such a u such that u hat rho hat u minus one is separable. And the proof is based on the Werner Wolf Serafini uh, theorem here. Okay, I will not have time to go through the proof here. Okay, what you use is a certain type of diagonalization here. Uh, well, actually it's formula 18, which is essential here. Uh, it says that if you have a positive definite symplectic matrix, you can diagonalize it by using a symplectic rotation. This is the meaning of formula 18. Then you do your little cooking there and you separate things and you use uh, 
your symplectic covariance of wild calculus and you get the result here. Partial tracing, same thing. I'm not going to comment more about that. The only thing is, well, which I didn't find in the literature, which does not mean that, it's, that it, it does not exist, is that the vile symbol of the reduced uh, density operators is just obtained by integrating the full Wigner transform. It seems so obvious, but uh, actually uh, I did not find any trace of it, any proof of it, but so it deserved to be written down. It's not fully trivial though, and well, anyway, thank you very much for your kind attention. is not good in this uh, in this place so please first question first question well okay that's a whole industry i have worked on it but i mean then it would take me really much time here in, in the ghost town case uh, it's not it's not difficult because actually if you take a Gaussian row as I wrote it, it's anyway always the probability a probability distribution. The question is, when does it become a, a quantum one? And a mystery for myself, and it's related to your question, is how can you detect actually a quantum Gaussian state from a classical Gaussian state? Gaussian state. <laughs> no, I cannot say much much here. I have worked on on semi-classical asymptotics and things like that. That everybody has done, especially in France, and you have several schools here, but uh, it's, no, I haven't had time yet to really deepen that. Yes? Please. Yes. But you're talking about the Gaussian case. Yes, yes. No, 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 it's not quite enough. It's not quite Well, I have to think about that, but it's really... Uh, wait, yes, because what you can do, actually, is to conjugate that by metaplectic operators and to reduce yourself to the standard coherent state. And in the standard coherent state, the Robertson Schrödinger operator reduce, of course, to equality in the Heisenberg inequality. Yes, so I think that yes, in this case, it's uh, it's quantum. Yes, 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 yes. yes. It, it, fun, nice question. Yes, uh, I think that in the Gaussian case, yes, it must, it might be enough. Next question. About? Twelve. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Let's go back. Uh, twelve, no. twelve, twelve. It does not appear. It's encore long, huh? No. I think, uh, yes. But we need uh, the screen. Ah. Yes, that's about the matrix G appearing in the Wigner transform okay. of, uh, of a Gaussian state. Yes?
I don't, I don't know really here because, of course, I did speak about Romanian geometry. I, 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 was, again, I was very limited. Here. You have to stick to the micro. Let's say this format 12, as you say, <laughs> is a very standard one, and I, I don't see directly any relationship with Romanian geometry. Perhaps there is one. I don't know, but then yeah. you, you can tell me that in. I, I suppose you are speaking about classical domains. You are speaking about classical domains uh, in uh, UA sense, for instance, uh, Siegel, and so, something like this, yes. Yes, because you, behind that you have uh, a coset, a specific coset of the simplistic group, uh, which have a very nice uh, Kellerian structure. Other oh, question, please. Basically, for extension of Go Gaussian uh, uh, extension definition, uh, we make a definition by maximum entropy of the density. Could we define an entropy for your Gaussian state? Or yes, you, you can. But I think it's rather classical already. Um, I, I written a, a conference proceeding paper. I can send it to you if you, if you like. But yes, because especially entropies are very easy to calculate in the Gaussian case because you obtain very Classical. There's another thing also then for the subsystems, and this I published in, a, in the Journal of Mathematical Physics last year, because there is a, a bipartite version of Gromov's non-squeezing theorem about the projection of the symplectic ellipsoid on the smaller phase spaces, and there you see the entropy appear very much in its properties. If you're interested, I can. I can send you that, but I haven't really deepened the topic. Hmm? So, any other question? Um, actually, just about that last point about entropy. Um, if you give me a density matrix, I can compute its entropy using the Bonham-Hudgens yeah. formula. Uh, what do you do with the Wigner distribution if it has negative values? Uh, in the Gaussian case, it does not occur uh, anyway. In the general case, yes. But in the Gaussian case, the Wigner distribution is always positive. Mm -hmm. Always. So there you have no difficulty. That's why people like working with the Gaussian case also, of course, because it's, it's almost classical. Uh, everything works like that, you see. Then in the general case of a general density matrix, I don't know. I don't know how you can circumvent the negativities Still, perhaps you can, but I mean, for arbitrary density matrices, the knowledge of the covariance ellipsoid is not enough because it only, it only uses the calculations of second moments. In arbitrary states, you have all the moments which are involved, which makes the things much more mm -hmm, difficult. Mm -hmm. But then I, I'm not an expert in entropic questions, so. Any other question? So let's uh, thank again Maurice for this. Thank you. <laughs>